Well, our theme, our message, and this study we've been doing through Nehemiah is Rebuild and Restore. And Nehemiah, well, he's been under all kinds of opposition, all kinds of attacks, difficulties, and he's been restoring and rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. There, there is this thing, and I believe it's very real in our spiritual walk, called spiritual warfare. Scripture says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You and I are not the real enemy, although it seems that way at times. But there's principalities, powers, and wickedness in high places. And you might be here today and you think, oh, the devil mumbo jumbo but the enemy's real a lot of people believe in lots of things like some people believe in uh well there's a picture here i've got of a bigfoot he's real see people, people, <laughs> there he is a lot of people believe in that guy and then there's another one that people believe in and it's this guy see you believe in the loch ness monster you know who he is There's all kinds of weird, mystical, metaphysical, you know, paranormal stuff that people get into. But there's also this reality of spiritual warfare. The walls, the gates have been torn down and Nehemiah has come back to rebuild. This city, Jerusalem... And and in that day, in that time, being conquered by the Babylonians, it wasn't given a lot of credence. It wasn't seen as a powerful entity. But, you know, today being Palm Sunday, you you think back to, to Jerusalem. Think back to if you've ever been there and stood and had the privilege of doing it many times on the Mount of Olives. And overlooking the, the old city and the walls around the city and, and, and make your way down that Palm Sunday road through the Garden of Gethsemane, across that Kidron Valley, and to those walls that are there today. This is not just some city. This is not just a place that, that Nehemiah showed up and said, hey, look, some walls are broken down. This is the city where the Son of God would make his way down from the Mount of Olives. And, and, and the Scripture says that, that if the people didn't cry out and worship, that even the rocks themselves would begin to praise him. I mean, that's some pretty powerful stuff. This is that prof- prophetic city, the walls that Jesus would be taken on the outside of with two other accused and condemned criminals. Those are the walls that he would pass by carrying a cross and be crucified for your sins and my sins. And and because this city is so significant, it's so prophetic, it's such a central place in the Scriptures, well, the enemy has come against Nehemiah. Doesn't want to see it brought back to significance. Doesn't want to see it rebuilt. This is Jerusalem. This place is filled with destiny and purpose. And it's a stage, if you will, of God's divine drama. It's an amazing place. And so the enemy behind the scenes is plotting and planning and coming after Nehemiah personally and individually. See, please tune in, please listen, as a, as a mom, as a dad, as an employee, as an employer, as a student, as a teacher, as a believer, any time you decide to take a stand, to serve, to, to walk out your faith, to rebuild those walls and, and restore your life in the Lord, to, to build godly walls in your life, which are so important. Well, when you decide, hey, I'm going to be a godly husband, 
I'm, I'm going to be a leader. I'm going to be a godly man or a godly woman or a godly wife. There will be resistance and temptation by the enemy for you to fail, to compromise. And they can't get Nehemiah to stop. So they wonder, well, maybe we can get him to compromise. So in Nehemiah chapter 6, which is our passage today, the first two verses, it happened. When Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, hey, let's meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But, he says, they're setting me up. They, they sought to do me harm. I mean, just the name of the place they want to meet is a dead giveaway, isn't it? Let's meet it. Oh, no. <laughs> On the border of Samaria. Whenever someone invites you to come hang out in Oh, no, you, your response is, oh, no. <laughs> I'm not going there. Come out from your wall what has been rebuilt and restored, and let's, let's meet halfway. That's the invitation in the Valley of Ono. So I sent, verse 3, messengers to them. And here's what I said. I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you. He knew they were enemies. He knew they were looking for compromise. They were looking for some kind of inroad to stop the work. So Nehemiah says, look, I'm doing a great work for the kingdom, for, for the Lord's holy city. It may just look like walls and brick and mortar and, and, and not such a significant thing to you. But it's like the middle, the center of what God's doing in my life, he says. This is, this is the Lord's work. This is what he's doing in my life. And you may have a job, you may be a landscaper or a pilot or work at Lowe's or whatever it is you do. That's the Lord's work. That's where he's placed you as light and, and salt. A mom, a dad, raising Godly kids. Now, we, we had a couple of grandkids over uh, yesterday for which seemed like an extended period of time. <laughs> and they hung out. One ended up spending the night. And uh, have the privilege of both of them uh, attending our little school here that's growing. Pray for the school. It's, a, it's so cool. to. Uh, that's one of the, the jobs I thought about, those who are teaching in the Calvary Christian Academy. And sometimes I'll, I'll park on this side and I'll walk by the kids early in the morning. And it is such a cool thing. They're all in their little uniforms, 60 kids or so. And they got the Christian flag out there and they got the American flag out there. And there's all these little kids up to second grade and they're standing there like this. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And I just stand there and I go, so cool. And, and they're being taught the Bible. They're being taught the truth about Jesus. They're being taught the truth about creation, that God created man and woman, created he them. And it's such a blessing. God, God designed us. He chose us. And, and whatever kind of job or place or neighborhood or situation he puts you in, hey, it's a great work. He, and Nehemiah says, why should I leave this great work and come down to the Valley of Ono? I'm not going to be compromised, he said, or, or get absorbed in, in this, this middle ground, this place of oh no, and let the enemy pull me away. And so part of our message, part of the, what's happening here is there's a, there's a message to you, there's a message to me about 
Hey, don't let the enemy pull you away from a great work where God's placed you, doing what he wants to do in your life and in your heart through compromise. Well, other parents are letting their kids do that. Oh, no, I'm not going to do it. Well, well, th that guy, he, he does this. It's not really legal. He's doing it with his taxes. Why can't I? Well, don't let God pull you away from his great work. Well, they live together and they love one another. Why, why can't I live with my boyfriend or my girlfriend? Why would you let God down? Why would you let the enemy pull you? See, Nehemiah knows that the work he's been given is, is God's. It's his timing. It's his calling. And down in Ono, here's what they're saying. Hey, we're down here in Ono. Come on down. We got mimosas. We got a big screen, the game's on, we can hang out, we can chill out, you don't have to be so concerned about what you're doing there, relax, it's no big deal. So I sent messengers to them, he says, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down, why should I cease and come to you? Compromise, always trying to pull us away, always trying to, in some way, put the button on pause. And then he says, but they sent me this message four times, and I answered them in the same manner. See, see let me have your attention. Compromise usually doesn't knock just once. Knocks twice, knocks three times. Here we see it knocks four times. If it's wrong the first time, it's wrong the second time, the third time, the fourth time, the 40th time, the 400th time, no matter how many times compromise comes knocking. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, we have this passage of Scripture, be sober. When it says be sober, it means don't be drunk. Be, be of sound mind. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Come on down to Ono. You don't have to be so serious about the Lord and rebuilding walls in your life and being involved in what God's called you to do. Just come on down. And he keeps knocking. He keeps asking. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, uh, we have a verse that says, and no wonder for Satan himself transforms himself to an angel of light. He makes it look so appealing, so, so fun. So, man, if you, if you dive into this, and the temptation is to, well, to draw us away, to get us distracted. In, in verse 5, as we're going through this passage of Scripture, this chapter, it says, Sam Ballot sent his servant to me as before, the fifth time, with an open letter in his hand, and it was written. It's reported among the nations, and Geshem says that you, speaking to Nehemiah, and the Jews plan to rebel. That's why you're building the walls, because you yourself want to be the king. And you've also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, Nehemiah, saying there is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king, so come therefore and let us consult together. So this time, they sent an open letter, a letter that could be read publicly, that you're into sedition, that you're into treason, that if you don't compromise, if, if you don't meet with us, well, we're going to expose you. And it's, it's nothing but, but gossip. It's slander. None of it's true. It's an open letter, it says. It's like, like they put it on Facebook. They put it on Twitter. They, they put it in a blog or on email. There's, there's no way for him to control it, who reads it or hears it. You're doing all of this because once you get the walls up, once you get the gates hung, you've got even false prophets saying that you should be the king of Judah. Not too long ago, we had a 
a time here in the sanctuary was just for moms and sons. It was um, a Nerf night where they could come and shoot their moms with. These are the, 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 the moms who suffered under their children's tyranny. So, so that got posted somehow on our website or somehow on our Facebook and someone took offense to it because, well, they weren't wearing masks. And there, there's, you, you've been there. You know what it's like. You don't wear a mask. You do wear a mask. Here's my stand on masks. Whatever you want to do. If you, if you feel safer wearing a mask, wear five masks. If you're safer, you, I mean, I, I wear a mask most of the time when I'm out. But someone saw that, and they sent out an open letter. And they were very upset about the fact that these moms and these kids, for the most part, didn't have masks on. And, and, and I, 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 I wasn't even, I'm not a mom. I wasn't at Nerf night. I didn't set Nerf night up. But, but someone else responded to, to the person who responded to the picture and they said, well, what do you expect of a church where the pastor paid $10,000 to have his brother's statue on the beach? And I thought, what? <laughs> I did what? The church didn't pay one penny to have my brother's statue on the beach. Now, if you examine the statue of my brother who's there by the pier, you notice it's a manly body because I posed for the statue. <laughs> But I did not pay $10,000 to have the statue on the beach. Now, I wonder how many people thought, wow, that church paid $10,000 to have his brother's statue on the beach with his manly body on it, which I didn't do. Nor is it a manly body for, for that matter. But it's just amazing what people can put out there and people read it hey, we hear that you're rebuilding this wall for your own self, that you're doing it to become king, that you've got false prophets, and there's all this open stuff being told around, and, and a lot of slander, a lot of accusations. You guys are rebelling. We know you are. This wall is all about you. This, all, this wall is all about you, Nehemiah, and your kingdom. So here's what you need to do, they say. You need, verse 7, uh, come and, and let us consult together. You need to meet with us. The secret's out. We'll help you. So this attack, this bombardment, if you will, is just constant, constantly coming at Nehemiah. Compromise, stop the work, meet with us. And then I sent to him, verse 8, No such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. Man, is that an old story. Where people invent all kinds of things in their heart because they're opposed to the kingdom or they're, they're against uh, what God is doing or they somehow want to uh, slander someone. Nehemiah knows it's all made up. It's once upon a time, long, long time ago. It's fairy tales. None of it's true. It's kind of like what was shared last week. If you take care of your character, God will take care of your reputation. He knows none of it's true. He goes, look, none of this. This is made up in your own hearts. For they were all, verse 9, trying to make us afraid their hands will be weakened in the work, and it will not be done. Now, therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. He knows they're just trying to weaken. He knows they're just trying to pause. He knows they're just trying to stop the work. So, so he cries out to God in a very simple prayer. God, strengthen my hands. Help me in this situation. Make me strong. They're trying to bring fear into the, to the whole 
situation. And in verse 9, and verse 13, and verse 14, and verse 19, you see the word afraid, 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 fear, or frightened. So, so this is one of the tactics of the enemy. The enemy uses fear in our lives. That's a powerful thing. It's a paralyzing thing at times. It, it, and many times, it's an irrational, untrue thing. You know, Adolf Hitler said this during World War II. He said, mental confusion, contradiction of feelings, indecisiveness and panic. Hitler says, these are our weapons. These are our weapons. If you can get people confused with what's real and what's true and what's not. When they don't really have a good grasp of Scripture. Well, I don't really know what's true and, and I don't know God's Word that well, so I, I don't know how to move forward. I'm afraid. Well, that's one of the enemy's tactics to bring confusion contradiction of feelings. The enemy can get you more focused on how you feel and what, what you want and what you desire versus what's true and what's right. See, I believe we live in a culture right now that's more concerned about their rights than what is right. Oh, if I can just have my rights, who cares what's morally right? Who cares what's godly? Who cares what's true? I just want my rights, right? Right? I mean, that seems to be where we're living. Indecisive. Well, I don't know how to move forward. I, I'm afraid. I, I'm panicky. And it creates all kinds of problems in your heart and in your life. Nehemiah gets very simple. Oh, Lord, just strengthen my hands that I can move forward. And sometimes I think that's just what you do in the midst of, you know, slander and confusion and people saying all kinds of things. You just say, Lord... I'm not going to stop the great work. I'm not going to stop where you've placed me, what you've called me to do. Just strengthen my hands to continue. That's a simple thing. It's a powerful thing. And then they throw this at him. Verse 10. Afterward, I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of, this is not Delilah, this is Deliah, the son of Mechedabel, who was a secret informer. And look what he says. Hey, let's meet together in the temple, in the house of God, within the temple, and let's close the doors, for they're coming to kill you. And then he adds this, indeed, at night, they'll come to kill you. They're coming at night, when it's dark, and when it's scary. They're coming to get you, Nehemiah. And it's going to be at night, when it's shadowy, when there's weird noises in the house, when the doors squeak. Hey, it's scary at night, right? Hey, they're coming to get you in the dark. So you need to come into the temple, which he wasn't allowed to do and shut the doors. And so Nehemiah responds, and he said, should, should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I would go into the temple to save his life? I will not do it. What, what a great response. They're coming for you at night. And he says, such a, should such a man as I... He says, are you calling me a wimp? He, he says, am I a coward? Am, am I such a person that I should be afraid and hide out? I love this statement. I love this response. Should such a man as I. I love this about Nehemiah, and I think we should all have some sense of this in our life, biblically and in our walk with the Lord. We know who we are. You, you, you want me to hide? You want me to run? Should such a woman as I, if you're a woman... Be one who's run, who runs and who's a coward? See, see, Nehemiah knew who he was. And I would also submit to you that he knew who his Lord was, who God was. And so he could respond. 
hey, I know who I am. And I know who God is. So you, are you saying that someone like me, he says, should cowardly run into the temple and hide because someone's coming after me at night? I, I love the story of, of Passover and Jesus having the meal with his men, laying aside his garments and washing their feet. And then he begins to tell them, that he's, that he's going away. In, in John chapter 14, we have this passage of Scripture. It says, he's saying to the men as he's getting ready to leave, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, but believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And th then he continues. And if I go, and if I prepare a place for you, I'll come again, I'll receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. So they're all listening. They're all dialed into this. And Thomas gets all freaked out. And he says, we don't know where you're going. I mean, I don't know the climate or what was going on in the room as Jesus is sharing that. You know, I'm, don't be afraid. Don't be, you know, scared. I, I, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And, and where I'm going, you, you're going. And you also know where I'm going. And finally, Thomas, he looks around the room. He's thinking, does, does anyone else really know? And he, he just says it. We don't know where you're going. And how can we know the way? So Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, he says, you would have known the Father. And from now on, you know him and you see him. Jesus is talking about himself. He's a representation of the Father. And then Philip speaks up. And Philip just says, show us the Father. And it is sufficient for us. And Jesus says to him, have I been with you so long, Philip? And yet you don't know me. He who has seen me has seen the Father, so now how can you say, show us the Father? And this is a powerful light bulb moment. Have I been with you so long, Philip? that you don't know who I am. And I think that as, as Nehemiah understands this, this attack and this slander and this, you know, trying to get him to cowardly run because someone's coming at, after him at night, he, he says, should such, a, should, should such a man as I? Because he knew who he was. And he knew who his God was. And I would submit to you, like, like unto Philip, who had walked with the Lord now for three years, he had had his feet just washed, he had seen Jesus do all kinds of miracles, powerful things. And Jesus says, Philip, well, listen to what he says to Philip again. Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me? And I think that's a great question for you to ask yourself and for me to ask myself. How long have you walked with the Lord? How, how long does it take for you to get to a place where you finally say, should, should such a man as I go down that road? Have I not been with you so long now that you don't know who I am? The Lord would say, I can strengthen your hands. How long does it take for you to decide who you are and who I am? He kind of confronts Philip with that. He confronts you and I with that. And there comes a time in your walk and in my walk and our life as Christians where we need to recognize what kind of man or woman I am and who God is. He says, I'm not a priest. I'm not a coward. Why should I run and hide? I've been called into a great work, into a, to an amazing thing for God. This is a city of Jerusalem. I'm not trying to become a king. I'm not trying to become some kind of rebel. 
It's a powerful statement. And Nehemiah stands up. He, he recognizes who he is, who the Lord is. And should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save my life? I'll not do it. Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all. But he pronounced this prophecy against me because of Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. It was a lie. It was not prophecy at all. And I would encourage you to be careful of people who come to you with, you know, the Lord told me to tell you this. Does it, first of all, does it edify? Or is it just something that they're trying to get you to do? Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, there's an interesting verse that says, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, the word of God, it is because there's no light in them. If somebody tells you something that's contradictory to the word of God, you can't make up your own truth, your own morality. God's will never violates God's word. Never. Never. I'll never forget a time when I was uh, uh, counseling this guy, and he had a wife and a young daughter, and he was seeing someone else on the side. And he came to me, and with, with all sincerity, he said, I believe God wants me to leave my wife and marry this other woman. I just looked at him and went, really? Now, why? Well, she's pregnant. Oh, so God's validated his his word through a illegitimate relationship and a pregnancy. I said, let's find that in the Bible. You can't make up your own truth. He gives us his word to protect us, to guide us, to correct us and encourage us. And the enemy is using fear many times to trap us, to confuse us. Well, if I don't take this money, if I don't cheat on my taxes, if I don't make this deal, even though I know it's not honest, well, God, we're not going to make it this month. Fear. Well, did you make it last month? By the skin of our teeth, Lord. Good. That's all I, however I want you to make it. Just trust me. Well, if I don't sleep with my boyfriend, he might dump me. And all my girlfriends do it, and all my boyfriends do it. What kind of man or woman are you? If I don't do, and if I don't, if I don't, and there's this fear, this afraid, this confusion. If I try to do it God's way, it's not going to work out. I've got to manipulate this thing and make it work out somehow because I don't know if the Lord will come through. Why do you say that? Philip, have I been with you so long that you don't know who I am? And I think if you're not careful, if I'm not careful, even in this, any whatever stage of relationship you are with the Lord, you can find yourself trying to because of fear and not knowing the truth or not really knowing the Lord, well, i got to work this out. And God, you're just going to have to forgive me because, I, you know, we're not going to make it otherwise. For this reason he was hired, verse 13. For this reason the enemy comes, that I should be afraid, verse 13 and act that way, and sin, so that they might have a cause for an evil report that they might reproach me. So here's the, here's the deal. See, they're going to set him up. Come on down to the Valley of Ono. Hey, run into the temple. It's going to be dark at night, and they're going to try to kill you. Do this, do that, in, in all these different ways, the first time, the second time, the fourth time, the fifth time. And so they were trying to set him up that they might reproach him, verse 13. First, the enemy tempts you. He pressures you. He, he tells you it's okay. And then the moment you step across the line, he goes, and you call yourself a Christian. He reproaches you over and over again. It's the, it's the same scenario. He, he'll pressure you in so many different ways. You finally step across that line, and then he 
calls you a spineless, good-for-nothing coward. And Nehemiah, throughout, if you're reading the story, if you're walking through it with us, you find him constantly in the midst of situations, analyzing the situation, recognizing where the voice is coming from, praying for God to strengthen his hands, and recognizing that he knows he's in the middle of something that God has called him to do, and he's not turning the other way. He's not going to run. In fact, in verse 14, he prays again, My God... Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, according to these their works, and the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. He says, God, just deal with these people. I'm not going down to the valley of Ono. I'm not running away. You, God, God you, you deal with them. And he recognized that their, their prophecies, their words, were all based on accusation and fear. I'll never forget, we, 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 until COVID and the whole stinking world went crazy. Did you know the whole world's crazy right now? Amen. It's completely bizarre and weird. We were, we were going back and forth to Haiti a lot. I'll never forget this. And my youngest son, Ryan, was leading a trip and uh, had this couple that wanted to go. And they seemed very sincere and they were new in the church and so they signed up, and we thought, okay, yeah, well, well yeah, we want to open the doors for ministry for as many people as we can. Let, let them be a part of the team. The team has to be small for Haiti because of housing that we stay in down there. So, yeah, we're going to go, but they just kept getting weirder and weirder, this couple. And they came to my son and said, we, we, we had a dream. I said, oh, what was it? Well, a dream we're flying to Haiti with you. And the plane went down. So we don't think the trip should happen. And Ryan said, well, what? <laughs> yeah, the plane went. And he said, we want to talk to your Pastor John about it. We don't think the church should go. And they, they never really came and talked to me, but they came back again and said, well, even though the plane is going to go down, we still want to go. And my, my, my son, Ryan, said, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, we still think we should go. <laughs> and, and I remember saying, you know what? That's a fear-based scenario. On a dream of this couple we don't hardly even know, who, who's trying to stop this great work that we've been involved in for a long, long time. And the evangelism and all that would go on there would, would not happen because some couple says they had a dream that the plane was going to go down. I said, what? We're going. But I'm not getting on the plane. <laughs> I, I would have gotten on the plane. I've gotten on it many times. And you know what? Our team went. But that couple didn't go. They just kind of disappeared. And, and the prophecy was all based on fear and conjecture. It had nothing to do with edification and building up, which, which the Scripture says prophecy does. The enemy. Well, look at verse 15. They, they would have made me afraid, he said in verse 14. And so the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elo. In 52 days. Now, here's the deal. Please tune in. Listen. The lessons learned building the wall were far more difficult than the physical labor of building the wall itself. And this is the story of Christianity. This is the story of your faith and mine. The lessons learned in interacting with others and with, with, with being a part of whatever God's called you to be a part of as a, as a godly husband or wife or, or, or a job that he puts you in or a neighborhood that he places you in, the things that you come in contact with and walk through and go through, 
are what God is doing to make you and fashion you and shape you and bring you into who he's called you to be. God's much more interested in you and your heart and you being able to come to the place where you say, what, 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 what man such as I or what woman such as I, and instead of just the physical things that you were doing. God, God can build a building. He can, he can you know, do all kinds of things, but it's your heart that he's trying to really build. And so as you read this story, even though it's powerful and amazing that, that God wants Jerusalem, which, will, will, which is even to this day uh, uh, you know, a, a central point in his prophetic picture for the whole world, he was doing something in Nehemiah and the people with the trials in their hands and the spears, and they were, he was teaching them who he was and what he can do. So the wall was finished, and it happened when all our enemies heard it, great verse, and all the nations around us saw these things. They were disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by our, who? Our God, not by our hands. Look what we did, Nehemiah would say. No. He says, here's what they saw. That this was God doing this, and that he strengthened them, and in 52 days they accomplished it. But the dust never settles. So in those days, the nobles of Judah, verse 17, sent many letters to Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came to them, and many in Judah were pledged to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechanab and the son of Arab and the son of Jonahim and married the daughter of Methuselah and son of Berechai. And they reported his good deeds before me and reported my words to him. Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. And even though the walls are done and the work is accomplished, the dust never settles. Listen, it never settles. As God's constantly working on the walls of your life and your heart and wants to strengthen your hand, and there's, there's warfare. doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. God has a great work, that's what it says, for you to do, for me to do, for us to do, to be involved in it, to know him and to know who we are. Should such a man as I? And there's compromise, and there's fear, and there's gossip, and there's slander. But, but, but like Nehemiah, we can stand on the truth. We can recognize that, that, that the call that he's placed us in and on, that the walls we are building and the gates that we're restoring that this is God's work. Listen, what God wants to do in your life and in my life and in our life and the life of our children and our grandchildren, it is not insignificant. No matter who around you might say, ah, what are you doing? That doesn't matter. It's not small. (laughs) I, I started this little bedtime story with my kids, and now it's passed on to my grandkids. It's about an imaginary frog named Roscoe. And Roscoe lives up in a tree. Well, Lynn and I were down in Tampa, St. Pete, about three or four weeks ago, and we're walking through this farmer's market or something, and there's all these, I think I may have told this story, there's all these little puppets, and they're just big frogs. And Lynn goes, you've got to buy that frog. No, I'm not buying that frog. That's a ripoff. She goes, no, you got to buy it. You put your hand in it, and it's got these big legs and these huge eyes, and you can put your finger in a tongue and make its tongue. So our granddaughter, Piper, was over last night, and Lynn goes, and and I'm in the other room actually reading over these notes, trying to be so spiritual. 
and they're in there in the bedroom, and, and I hear Piper, Pop! Pop! You got to come and tell Roscoe the River Frog story. I think, should I, such a man as I, leave the work that I'm doing? <laughs> I come in there and put a frog on my hand. Yes, I'll be right there. <laughs> so as so I'm, I'm laying on them, telling this story about a frog. But I got to talk to her through the frog about the Lord, about her. And I thought, this is no insignificant work, even though it looks like it. And, and, and I want you to know there is no secular, there is no spiritual, they're all one. I, I'm, a, I'm putting the bricks on, I got the spear in my hand. This looks like manual labor to me. No, this is the city of Jerusalem. This is the city where, where Jesus will walk down that road and they'll be throwing palm fronds at his feet. This is the city where he'll come outside and be crucified. This is the city where he will return and rule and reign. This is the heart that he'll use. These are the hands he'll use. This is the life he'll use. It's no insignificant thing. They perceived, and there could be no greater perception for you or me that someone be able to look back at your life or look at your life now and perceive that this work was done by God. Isn't that amazing? And that's the story of Nehemiah. The walls completed, and they recognize, hey, these guys didn't do it on their own. We don't compromise. We want people to know that this is the work that God has done.